Let's get into the word this morning. Turn to Exodus chapter 20 if you would. We'll read the scripture and then we'll have prayer. And um, we will not have a service this afternoon. My voice, I don't think, will hold up to it. So, um, but we're in the Ten Commandments. And I'm going to preach this morning on a commandment. That I know for a fact I have been guilty of. And it may surprise you. Exodus chapter 20. Verse 1. And God spake all these words saying. I am the Lord thy God which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Out of the house of bondage. Number 1. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Commandment number 2. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. I want you to help me to pray about something while I'm, while I'm thinking about this. Uh, the next trip that I make to Kenya. I am seriously considering inviting the local Catholic priests in Turkana, Kenya... To a public debate on why Catholicism is not biblical. I'm praying about it. I'm not a debater. Uh, I just am not. I don't like it. I shy away from it. And there's a reason why. It's usually I get mad and frustrated and, and end up losing it. And I don't like to do that. But I want you to help me pray about that. If the Lord's in it, he'll work it out. If not, he'll take it out of my heart and he'll make me scared and I'll run like a little girl. But just help me pray about that. But that reminded me of that. Verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation unto them that hate me. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Number uh, three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Verse seven, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Number four, verse eight, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Number five. Now I'm counting these for a reason. Verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. There's a blessing. There's grace. Five is often associated with grace. Fifth time Noah's name is mentioned. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. There's grace. There's a promise in the fifth commandment that if you honor thy father, your days will be long. God will have mercy on you. have grace on you. Have you live a long life. Listen, I want to go to heaven. There's, no, there's a part of me who wants to go right now. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But I tell you what, when the grandkids come marching in, or when I come in in the mornings, come into the building and the grandkids are already here, they line up behind me and we get in the, the candy train. And we go marching up the steps, woo woo, go into my office and get a piece of candy one at a time. And I'll tell you what, I have more fun than having a barrel of monkeys. And that makes me want to live to be an old man to see my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. So there's grace in that. Now, commandment number six. I've broken it. Thou shalt not kill. Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you, God, for Lord, I thank you for letting me come be back in the pulpit. 
Father, I'm sorry. The weakness of my body and my mind has taken me away from the thing that I love. Outside of you, God, and outside of my wife and family, Lord, I, I would never want to put them in any kind of order except you first. But God, preaching the word, teaching it, talking about Jesus, talking about the wonders of this book to people, Lord, is just one of my favorite things in the whole world. And Father, the weakness of my mind, the weakness of my body, has taken me away from that, and I don't like it. Uh, Father, I thank you for the rest that you've given me. I thank you for the encouragement that you've laid on people's heart to send my way. I thank, Father, for the people that sent cards, well wishes and prayers. Lord, please bless them back for me. Bless them double. Bless them sevenfold for their reaching out to us as a church, praying for us and for the many people that come here. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would bless those that are still suffering right now from being sick, whether it's the flu, the COVID, or anything else going on. You've got cancer going on. Liz's dad slowly but surely vanishing away from dementia. That's hard. That's a hard watch to watch people go that way. I pray, God, that you'd give them blessing. And Father, all the People in our church, Lord, that still mourn the loss of their loved ones. Most recently, Brother Roy with Sister Bonnie. I pray, dear God, that you would just bless each and every one of them and continue to help them, Lord. I miss, the, I miss these people. I miss them. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would just bless their wives and their husbands. Father, bless those, Lord, that Lord, it's just not in their heart to get up and come to the house of the Lord. This sickness, Lord, and, and this time that we're living in has had its effect on their life. And now they're starting to use excuses and give reasons why they're not coming. I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would just help them and encourage them, Father, that, Lord, the time is drawing near. We're not getting farther away from your coming. We're getting closer. We're not getting farther away from dying. We're getting closer every day. So Father, Lord, give them encouragement. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless our ministries. Not just, not just what goes on in Kenya. Lord, I thank you, God, for that. That is a tremendous, awesome thing, God, that you're doing over there. And Lord, just keep doing it. But Father, the people that we're reaching here in our own home, in our own country, our brothers and sisters in this land and in other places around the world, Lord, continue to help us be a blessing to them. Help me to keep standing. Help me to keep preaching. Help me to keep doing right and teaching right. Lord, Father, I pray, God, that you would give me the health, the strength, the stamina of mind, heart, and spirit. Lord, to continue to be what you called me to be until the day you take me out of here. Father, I pray, dear God, that you'd bless the message this morning. For I am guilty, Lord, in the way that you have laid it out in scriptures. I am guilty of violating this particular commandment. Father, I pray your forgiveness and your mercy upon not only me, but upon your people, Lord who, as the scriptures have laid it out, have also, we, we don't think of ourselves as murderers, but God, the way, the way your Holy Ghost lays it out in scripture, we are. Help us to see it. And in seeing it, help us to repent. And in repenting, Lord, help us to change. And in changing, Father, help us to make a difference through love in somebody's life. Father, bless your word this morning. <clears throat> bless all those who are attending. Bless those who are watching and listening. Lord, use this however you want to for your glory, your kingdom's sake, your honor. Blessed be the name of the Lord and blessed be his word even above his name. 
We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. And you say, Brother Mike, how is it that you're guilty of killing? Is it because you take the life of innocent deer? Believe it or not, we had a group of um, followers from Great Britain several years ago followed our ministry. And I'd talk about going deer hunting. And I don't know, I don't know, I, I've only been in London once, spent a day there in a layover, don't really know the people that well, but I understand that they, it is illegal for most people in England, Great Britain, the United Kingdom, to own a gun, to have a gun, be able to use a gun, uh, or to be able to hunt. And I was chewed out one side down the other because I went out in the woods, killed a deer, did it repeatedly, taught my sons how to do it. My dad taught me how to do it. Shoot squirrels and eat them. Shoot rabbits and eat them. Shoot deer and eat them. And they chewed me out and they said, you're violating the word of God. They said, thou shalt not kill. So let me just make sure that you understand that when God said, thou shalt not kill, he did not mean you cannot step on ants and roaches. You can't. And I'm going, have you not been to McDonald's? Have you not eaten fish out of the ocean? Does that not count? And uh, I was not able to convince them. They were still convinced that I was wrong. As we're all in, in America, we're wrong. For hunting and killing. No, it is God's providence given to mankind to rule over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and the beasts of the earth. And to use them how we see fit. And I believe in that. Deuteronomy 5, 5, 17 says it exactly the same way. Thou shalt not kill. But I want you to look in Matthew chapter 19. I want you to turn your Bible there. And I want you to make yourself a note just in case this issue comes up to you and somebody says, well, the Bible says thou shalt not kill. And by the way, I am also for capital punishment. What are you talking about? I'm talking about the death penalty. I am 100% for it. I believe we ought to go back to a public hanging of people the way it used to be done, they would say, well, that doesn't have any effect on, on the crime rate. You're wrong. You are, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it doesn't have any effect. It'll have an effect on that one who took an innocent life, whether by the gun, the sword, the knife, the hand, the, the drunken vehicle driver, or whoever it was, you took an innocent life. Your life should be taken from you according to the word of God. God said that in Genesis 9 before he ever put it into the law. He said it as Noah and his family was coming out of the ark. It was the first law given to man as a form of, as he formed civil government. As population grew, God said, if a man sheds another man's blood, by man, his blood shall be shed. God said that in Genesis 9, for he ever gave us a law. Jesus never contradicted it. And when it said, thou shalt not kill, it does not mean you can never, ever take the life of another human being. What it means, Matthew chapter 19, verse 18. Jesus made sure that it was said this way. He saith unto him which, Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder. The Bible just defined for you what God meant. Not Mike Hoggard, not the scholars, not the Pope. God just defined for you what God meant when he said, Thou shalt not kill. He meant do no murder. Murder is the taking of an innocent life. A life of someone who's not been found guilty of violating any capital 
I mean, God didn't kill everybody in the Old Testament in Israel for every little violation of a crime. He didn't kill them. Sometimes they were to receive the lash. Sometimes they were to be, um, uh, had, they were to make reparations. But in some cases, capital punishment was required. And it was to be done swiftly. And it was to be done publicly. Not hidden away. This is what God said. There was a sign that was sent to me. I was going to put it in my notes. I just got too busy with traveling and getting ready for going down south and everything like that. But it was a billboard that the Satan worshipers put up that said, The God we serve does not require the hitting of children. In other words, we as Christians believe we can spank our children. No. But the God that you serve desires the innocent blood of unborn children. Somebody say amen. Murder is the taking of an innocent life. No matter what age, no matter what form that takes, it is the taking of an innocent human life. And if you think that God is against killing animals, what happened in the tabernacle and the temple every single day? John, what happened in that temple every day? They killed animals. They killed animals as a form of substitutionary sacrifice for the sins of mankind. Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. They are all on even par as far as God is concerned. Now, I'm going to deal for a few minutes with the abortion issue. And no, that's not what I'm guilty of. But I know some people that are. I know some women that have in their long ago past had an abortion. It is not my intention to um, condemn you more or to say that you're more guilty than anybody else who's ever done anything wrong. But I must say what the Bible says. And let me, let me give it by way of illustration. When I was in Bible college, uh, I, I was one of the few in the dorm that had a television set. And every Sunday night, after several of us guys were attending our, the churches we went to, we'd come back, they'd all pile up my dorm, and we had two shows that we used to like to watch right after we got back from church. And they were, they were not, I mean, they, were, they weren't cartoons or, you know, sitcoms or anything like that. One was a Methodist preacher in Oklahoma City. He was a liberal. I mean, a blatant, flaming, leftist, socialist liberal back in 1985. And he's talking about how it was okay to be a sodomite and it was okay to be gay and this, that, and the other. And then he got off on the abortion issue. And he said, you can't tell me that God is in some poor woman who has been violated or, or who has a baby that she does not or cannot take care of. You cannot tell me that God is for the birth of that child. And I mean, we wanted to take our, we wanted to kick the television in, wanted to throw it out in the parking lot and run over it with our cars. I mean, we were just flaming mad at this idiot who was pro-abortion. Let me tell you something. The Democrat Party, the Socialist Party, the leftist people in this country, they hate life. They are murderers and they have the blood of innocent children on their hands. Life does not begin at birth. It begins where God said it begins in the womb. If you don't like that, I can't help it. I'm the messenger. I'm only reading what God said. You say, well, you can't prove that from the Bible. Oh, yes, I can. I wouldn't be up here. Psalm 22, verse 10. Look at, what, look at what your Bible says. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. 
When I personally, my congregant, was in my mother's belly, God was my God. I may not have known it, but God was watching over me. He was with my mother to make sure that I stayed alive. God was with me in my mother's womb. Psalm 22. And that psalm's about Jesus. And according to the leftist socialist idiots in this country, they would have, they would have had Mary abort Jesus rather than suffer the shame of giving birth to a child supposedly out of wedlock. Isaiah 49, 1. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, ye people, from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother, he hath made mention of my name. I suppose, I don't remember it, but I suppose I was called to preach from my mother's womb. Jason, did not God know when you were inside your mother's womb the day that he was going to save your soul and forgive all of your sins? Did God not know that while you were still inside your mama's womb? Did he know that? Sure he did. Jeremiah chapter 1, 5 nails it. God said, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Now, let me, let, me, let me clear up this ridiculous nonsense about, well, except in the case of rape or incest. Let me clear that up. According to this verse, who is it that puts babies in the wombs of mothers? It's God. In fact, I'm going to ask you a question. How many children were born to Ham, Jam, Shem, and Japheth while they were on the ark? Zero. You think they abstained for a year on the ark? Would you? If you were married? No. God just did not form any children in them. He wanted eight people to go on and eight people to come off, and that's what he wanted. And then after they got off the ark, God said the words, be fruitful and multiply. And what happened with every animal and the, and the humans that came off that ark? They filled, they filled this whole earth with creatures and human beings. So don't give me that other nonsense about rape or incest or anything else. God, God is the one. If God, if God puts a baby in a woman's womb. Then where is it that says man has the right to take it out and kill it? It's not in his word. You say, you're being mean. You're, you're, you just hate women. No, I don't. You know what I'm telling you? Even in the tragedy of that situation, God's grace is still sufficient, is it not? You think I hate? Women, you think I hate a woman who has to deal with that? No. But we can't blame the child for the sins of the father. Can't do it. That's the murder of the innocent life. Murder. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. God was saying that of Jeremiah. Of course, God was, we know God was saying it about Christ as well. Luke chapter 1, verse 15. The angel Gabriel's telling the parents of John the Baptist, he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He's going to be a Nazarite, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. Now you could say, well, you know, that means from the mother's womb. It means that when he's born, he's full of the Holy Ghost. 
Well, that doesn't match with Scripture. Because we find out in verse 41, And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Who was the babe that leaped in the womb of Elizabeth? It was the same John the Baptist. And why did he leap? Because he heard the salutation of Mary, and he knew it was Jesus! You don't murder babies. And if you've been guilty of that sin, repent. God will forget. Listen, I told this story, but in the Nashville jail, leading that man to the Lord, to me, one of the greatest times that I think I've ever evangelized somebody in my personal life was sitting next to this black guy in Nashville City Jail. And the Bible college sent us there. One of the guys preached. I turned to him. I said, would you like to... Pray and be forgiven of your sins. I showed him the Romans road of salvation. I asked him, I said, would you like, would you like for God to forgive you of your sin? You know what I think? I think he had a praying grandma. I think that, I think that guy had a grandma that went to church and knew something about the Lord Jesus because he immediately said yes with tears in his eyes. Yes, I want God to forgive me. And I, without me asking what he did, I led him through. He prayed the prayer. And I said, how do you feel? He said, whoa, feels like a shot of whiskey. I kind of got tickled at that. And I finally talked to him a little bit. I said, I'm going to be praying for you. In fact, I'll pray, I'll, I will remember you the rest of my life. And I've never forgot him. I prayed for him. I said, what are you in for? He said, murder. Now, chances are, what do you think? You think he was on a bum rap? Chances are they had a murderer in jail. And he was sitting next to me. God put him next to me for a reason. And I've prayed for that man often. Because I only had one chance to be with him. And after that, I don't know what happened to him. But I hope to see him in heaven. I'd like to see that murderer in heaven because God can do that you believe that say amen now let's look at what the Bible says more I want to read some scriptures to you Matthew 5 21 you've heard that it was said by them of old time thou shalt not kill and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment we'll make sure we're still everything going okay and uh, Matthew or Mark 10 verse 19 thou knowest the commandments do not commit adultery do not kill do not steal do not bear false witness defraud not honor thy father and mother do you think God separates these out and says one of them is worse than the other not when Jesus is including them all together verse 20 I want you to look at this story with me for a minute and I'm going to explain something to you about what's in this he answered, this is the young man that came to Christ and said, what must I do to be saved? And he said, thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and thy mother. Now, Jason, I'm going to pick on you again simply because J.R. is too young. and I don't want to pick on Jan. I'm afraid of her. Okay? As you look at this passage of Scripture... Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. All you have to say is yes. Have you broken any of these commandments in your life ever? Okay, that's fine. Is it, even if it's just one, have you broken at least one of these? Okay. So watch this now. You're not alone. Romans 3.23 says... For all is sin to come short of the glory of God, right? So verse 21, he, or verse 20, he answered and said, Unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Was he lying or telling the truth? He was lying through his teeth. So then Jesus counters it by saying, then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possession. He had lied through his teeth 
to the Lord God above, Jesus Christ. And Jesus knew it. Okay, then give up everything you've got, take up your cross and follow me. Well, I can't do that. So he was going to rely upon his alleged observance of the laws of God when in fact he was guilty of breaking them. Same thing in Luke. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. Same story told a little bit differently. Turn to Romans chapter 13. Now we're going to get into how I broke it. I've been guilty of it. Boy, I don't want to tell this. It may seem like nothing to you. But I've regretted it every day. Every day of my life. I was in high school. Had already surrendered to the call to preach. Had my Jesus loves you pin on my letter jacket. I got on the bus to go home, went to the back of the bus. Because they picked the high school guys up first and we could get the back of the bus and make the little kids sit up front. That's where they wouldn't bother us. Notice they had a substitute driver. And I'd seen this guy before. I liked him. He was a nice guy. He was black. And I wasn't thinking. But I'd gotten in with some guys that were using, telling jokes and using foul language. And I got in with them thought that was funny. And I was doing some of it at the time and just had a habit of just letting it out every now and then. And without, I'm, and God is my witness. Without even thinking. And then it dawned on me that bus driver was sitting up there. And I ducked down behind that bench. I felt about that big. And when it came to my time to get off the bus, I, I thought, man, he's going to nail me for sure. You know what? He never did. I've regretted that ever since. Would like to see that man, and even if, even if he didn't remember it, apologize to him. And say, will you forgive me? Romans 13, verse 9, here's what the Bible says. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely... And that you underline this in your Bible. Here's the, com here's the real commandment we're supposed to keep. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now I'm going I'm to ask you a question. You think that's the first time that guy ever been... You think that's the first time he's ever been called that? No. The man that I met... Sam's back when all the Black Lives Matter and the Antifa stuff was flaming everywhere. BLM was protesting everything. It was obvious that there was trying to be set forth in our country a division, a great chasm in our nation. And I'm going to say this. Barack Obama started it he started it he had an opportunity to unify this nation in a way that had never been done and he he did what his black panther background led him to do 
He drove division more and deeper into this country. But I saw this man, this black man in Sam's. He had his military cap on. You know what I did? I went up to him. I didn't shake his hand, COVID, you know. I said, sir, thank you for serving your country. And he said, it was my pleasure. I said, where did you serve? He said, well, let me tell you. He said, I grew up in a single parent home. He didn't tell me where he's from. He said, I grew up in a single parent home, one of about 14 children. And he said, we didn't have anything when I was growing up. But thanks to the United States military, I got to see the entire world and serve this country all over the world. And I mean, I've got tears rolling down my eyes. And I'm saying to myself, Mike, how many times do you think this guy's been called a name? By the very people in this country that he went to serve and protect. And yet, he's not angry. He stands in honor and says, I'm thankful to serve my country. And I went up to him, put my hand, just patted him on the back. I said, sir, don't let them divide us. He said, no, we won people. I cry about that every time I think about it. Love thy neighbor the way you would want him to love you. Yes, there are great sins in this country against minority groups, people that don't look like us. But we don't have to keep perpetuating it. Verse 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Now, now it's time to be a different kind of people. James chapter 2. Turn there in your Bible. Verse 8. He said, if you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture... Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. The royal law, he called it. But if you have respect to persons, you know what that is, don't you? Excuse me, ma'am, you have to sit on the back of the bus. Why? Because you're black. Excuse me, sir, you cannot drink from this water fountain. Why? Because you're black. Excuse me, folks. I don't know what part of gook land you're from. But here in this country, we're going, to have, we're going to have to stop that. We're going to have to stop looking at people and their facial features and immediately judge them on the basis of where we think they came from. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all, verse 10 says. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Let me go back to verse 9. I didn't read it all. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Now, I'm not saying we all have to live together. We all have to... People like being with their own kind. I get that. Asian folks like to eat things that I would look at. And I'm going, I'd never eat that in my life. My dad used to catch, bless his heart, when he was an older teenager before he married my mom. He'd go out every Sunday down the Arkansas River and catch catfish and whatever he could catch for himself. And if he caught any turtles or he caught any uh, alligator gar... Or if he caught any carp, he'd put them in a separate ice chest. And on his way home on Sunday, he'd pull up to a black church that was having church. And he'd honk the horn once. 
And a couple of fellows would come out and say, How you doing, Mr. Don? How you doing, Mr. Don? My dad would open up the trunk and give them the gar and the turtles and the, and the, and the carp because they love to eat them. And I look at that and I'm going, Ugh! They're different, but they ain't worse. Now look at James chapter 4, verse 2. You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you have not. Because you ask not. What is the source of wars? Hatred. Why did Hitler start World War II? Hatred among the races. How many people had to die for that man's hatred? Over 50 million people on this planet died as a result of Hitler and the, the by the way, the empire of Japan. Japan hates the Chinese. Japanese hate the Chinese. To this day, they hate the Chinese. And I'm going, I'm looking at them going, they're all the same to me. But they hate each other to this day. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. How would you like for God to do that to you? With your hatred. To do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. A man and his wife left this church, did not, did not give me a real reason why they were leaving, but after they left, everybody that they saw at Walmart, they said, well... Brother Mike went and let his daughter marry a black man. We ain't going to that church no more. Okay. If they didn't like that, boy, would they not like what we're doing now? Verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. That's how you're guilty. That's how you're guilty. Galatians 5. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. Hatred. Variance, emulations, wrath, strife. Hatred is murder, by the way. That's how I'm guilty of murder. It's because of hatred. I got mad after 9-11 at every dark-skinned Arab I saw, every Muslim. And I carried hatred and vengeance in my heart for years. And I've asked God to deliver me from that. Especially with what I believe. I think I think they are the seed of Abraham through Ishmael and God made a promise that he'd make a great nation out of them. Who am I? But he, Paul said, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 John chapter 3, turn there and I'll close. This is how you're guilty. 1 John 3.11, for this is the message you've heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Not as who? After Adam and Eve, what was the first sin committed? Murder. Murder. After Adam and Eve, the first sin committed was hatred against his own brother. Murder. Man was created on day six. Thou shalt not kill sixth commandment. I think there's a reason. I think, it's, I think it's connected. God favors life. If God had a problem with Abel, then let God handle it. God is a righteous judge. We're not. We judge people that don't deserve to be judged. I want to show you an illustration here in a minute. 
Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, who slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother, his brother! I mean, we're talking about within families. Hatred is rampant. Hate your own brother. Hate your own sister. Hate your mom and dad. That's murder. Hating your church, fellow church members. Being jealous over them. Being mad at them. Judging them for things that you heard they did when it was not your right to hear about it. What if they heard about you? What if your sins were exposed in front of the whole church through gossip and backbiting? How would you want to be treated? Would you want to be forgiven? Would you want brotherly love to pass your way? Then send it down the line to somebody else. We don't bayonet our wounded. We heal them and lift them up and forgive them. But we don't hate them. If they come to this country legally, they are our brethren. We are, we are a unique nation. Italy's full of Italians. China's full of Chinese. Japan has some of the most strict immigration laws in the world. Uh, aside from North Korea, probably. Japanese are proud people about what? About being Japanese. So much so that they despise other peoples. It's not the law of God. We know that we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. And whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. There it is. You're guilty. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God because, watch this, because he did what? What does it say he did? Laid down his life for us. A Jew laid down his life for Gentiles. Unheard of. And we ought to lay down our lives for who? The brethren. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for a friend. Everybody look up on the screen. You know who Dory Miller is? Jan, you know who he is? I spent the last two weeks watching American History Channel. So I, I picked up on this. You see, in World War II, the United States Army and the United States Navy, they would recruit and take in Black men, but not as soldiers. Because the thought was that probably most black men in the face of a battle would run. That was their concept. If we put a gun in their hands, put them on the front line, all they'll do is run like chickens, and then we'll have to put all the white guys in. That, I'm not kidding you, that was what they thought. If you were a black man serving in the United States Navy, guess what you were doing? You were either cleaning toilets or you were a steward, which means you handled all the mess halls or you did the worst job down in the bilge pumps or whatever. You were not trained on weaponry. You were not trained on different warfare assignments. You were nothing but a paid servant on that ship. Dory Miller was assigned to one of the ships at Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. As a steward, as somebody who handed out dishes of food to the white sailors and the captain's and the officers of the ship was never trained with a rifle, never trained with any of the guns. But what he did was he used to sit on the deck in his off time 
and watch the guys fire those weapons on the ship. It fascinated him. December 7th, 1941. On the particular ship he was on, while his white shipmates were diving over the side to save their lives, Dory Miller, they called him Dory. Guess what his real name was? Doris. That's a woman's name. They called him Dory. Dory Miller, who according to Navy regulations, should have ran like a chicken, went down into the ship to find white sailors to save their lives and pulled, started pulling his fellow sailors out of that ship, saving their lives. After the initial bomb attack, the second wave came in. Dory Taylor Miller... After saving, I don't know how many of his white shipmates saw the deck gun, no one was on it. He grabbed the deck gun, having never been trained on it, and shot down Japanese planes as they boom, 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 boom. The picture you see here is one of the last pictures we have of him. He was awarded... The Navy's, I forgot what they call it, but the outstanding honor, usually never given to porters, never given to servants in the Navy. They awarded him with a medal of honor, rightfully so. The reason why this is the last known picture we have of him is because during the war he shipped out and his battleship was sunk by the Japanese. You know what he did? He gave his life for all the white people in America who called him a nigger and told him to his face he wasn't good enough to have a gun in his hands. And this is the cartoon that was drawn of him in his honor. There's Dory Miller shooting down a Japanese plane at Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. We've changed, haven't we? We have changed as a nation. We began to look back on the sins of our youth and say, yeah, we were wrong. But we're not done. There's always love to have for people. As a preacher of the gospel, it is not my responsibility to judge anybody based upon the color of their skin or even the content of their character, knowing that all men are sinners and that they are equal before the eyes of God. It is my responsibility to give them in love the gospel of Jesus Christ because Jesus died for everybody, not just white folks. Somebody say amen. So you don't have to have killed somebody to be a murderer. All you have to do is hate. Now I'm preaching this message to white folks as well as black folks. Because racism goes both ways. It goes both ways. And Hispanics. And Asians. And Canadians. And whoever it is. Let's love our brother. Father, we come before you. Father, if you hadn't changed my heart, the greatest, without a doubt, the greatest thing this church has ever done would have never happened. Thank you for changing our hearts.
and for reaching out to give sacrificially for the benefit of people whom the world doesn't think much of. Even other tribes around them hate them. They hate each other. So why should we get in the middle of it? Because you told us to love them as if we were them. If it was me sitting out in that desert starving to death, I would want somebody to come by and bring me food. Father, we ask God that you change our hearts about how we see people and how we judge people. Help us, dear God, to not have hatred in our hearts, even for our own family members that have done us wrong. But help us to love them. It, love doesn't mean fellowship. Love doesn't mean we have to sit next to them and get along. We can love each other from a distance. But I'd rather love somebody from a distance than hate them and be next to them. God, forgive us of the hate, forgive us of the murder, forgive us of our sins, help us to fulfill the royal commandment, the holy law of God. And that is to love our fellow man and to love our neighbor as we would want to be loved by our neighbor. Bless your holy word this morning. Bless this day. Blessed be the name of the Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming.